Thank you, Diara, for that lovely welcome. It was a surprise. Um, <laughs> very nice. Uh, so um, thank you all for joining here in the room. And I know uh, we're Facebook streaming uh, live as well. So to anybody that's tuned in, um, good morning and welcome to the Workspace Business Insights Breakfast. Uh, so uh, by way of introduction, I am Lara Hanlon from IBM. Uh, I'm based in Dublin um, and I'm here to have a really nice conversation about design thinking, uh, which hopefully, um, you know, by the end of this morning, you'll, you'll have lots of um, insightful, practical um, kind of tips and tricks to take back to your business, but just some food for thought as well. Um, and I'm going to be, you know, poking both of my panelists here, uh, asking the questions, uh, and I'm going to introduce them this morning. So to my right, um, your left. We have Zoe Stanton. So Zoe is a co-founder and managing director of Us Creates, a service design agency um, working with clients in health and well-being sector. And uh, we have Samantha Davies, who leads user research and works with product uh, at Monzo. So um, my understanding is Monzo is, is tipped to be the future of banking. So that should be quite interesting to hear from both Zoe and Samantha this morning. Um, so how we're going to run this is I have a couple of key questions that I'm going to, to throw out to my panelists and we're going to have a, a chat um, and then at the end of that conversation we'll open it up to the floor so you'll have a chance to, to also kind of pick up on some of the points that we, we raise um, or you know come in with your own kind of uh, questions and perspectives as well. So um, I'm looking forward to the conversation and I hope you are as well. Um, so really, I'm going to jump straight in, and I'm going to ask the question, what is design thinking? So maybe we'll start with you, Zoe. Um, sure. You know, I think the question is a little bit longer, but I, I'd like to get your, your thoughts on you know, just what is design thinking as far as you're concerned? OK. So for me, design thinking is um, a different and often, but not always, better way of solving problems. So that's what it is in a nutshell, I suppose, if should yeah. I expand a little bit? or I think that's, that's great. Maybe, Samantha, if you want to give your thoughts on what is design thinking in your opinion. Similar. Uh, really, it's about the creative process of problem solving, and it's about using empathy and experimentation to find the solutions that you, that you think are going to be the best ones, right? OK, so um, problem solving techniques, I guess. Uh, and so when we think about design thinking, uh, the word design is part of, of uh, the term design thinking. So maybe um, kind of on top of this idea of what is design thinking, you know, what is design and, and is design really good business, right? It's this term that we often hear um, and design thinking being used in businesses now. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Okay. Um, so design, well, so is it is it good business? Like, of course, I'm going to say absolutely yes. So it's what my business does, but um, it's also how we do it. So um, it's all about drawing on create, like, different ways of thinking about things, creative thinking, really understanding people and how they, what makes them tick and how they work, looking at things from different angles, trying, testing, look, trying to do things in different ways. And that's how, first of all, we run our business. It's, it, I study design, I train design. It's kind of all I know, so that's how I created the business, but it's also what we offer as a service to our clients in the public sector, private sector, third sector. Um, and we help and we use that as a as a way of solving tricky challenges and problems. Um, and Samantha, do um, you think that good design is good business? Absolutely. Um, I think um, design thinking was all about innovation and it's about designing for our future customers rather than necessarily using historical data to try and do things in the same way. So if we're trying to innovate, if we're trying to solve new problems for future customers that haven't yet um, had their needs met, then for me that means that it is going to be good business mm -hmm. because it's doing something differently, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of interesting, both of you, um, you know, started off talking about um, how it's 
design and design thinking is used to solve problems, right? But it is also to innovate, right? So it's, there may not be a problem necessarily, but uh, it can be used to create new spaces and new thinking as well, which is also really interesting. And I think that, that definitely is a space where designers really thrive. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be kind of interesting to get your sp perspective really around the innovation side of things and, and how does design thinking drive innovation across organisations? Yeah. Um, so I suppose just bouncing off those points, so abs like absolutely, I think it's not just about solving problems now, it's about looking for those opportunities in the future. But I do think it has a role to solve like age-old problems that we've been trying to solve for blimmin' ages um, in new and different ways, because if we keep trying to solve them in the old ways, like it's not working. So <clears throat> um, i just talk about an example to, Great. to link in with the innovation piece. So we've been doing... Um, some work on childhood obesity. Like this is like our children um, eating unhealthily and, and being obese is just a growing problem. I think it's, I read the other day, it's like one in four leave primary school obese and we're worse than America now. So it's like a massive, massive problem that, of course, loads of resources, like Jamie Oliver's been doing it, government's been doing it, like there's lots going on. Um, and we work a lot for the NHS, so uh, we were lucky enough to get involved in a, innovation piece around looking at new ways to solve this challenge and problem um, did a lot of under trying to understand it in different ways spending time with families eating with them living their lives with them so we could understand it and look at it from new angles and perspectives and then we worked to um, develop a range of ideas but one of them was um, what we found was there was an, a, ch a challenge around access to healthy ingredients and confidence in cooking there's lots of challenges around that so the outcome of a process, which is quite long-winded, but cut a long story short, um, is a new healthy food delivery service. It's an affordable one. So it's like HelloFresh or something like that. Um, but it's called Make It, and it's an affordable um, delivery service. Um, and it started really small on an estate in, um, in, in Hackney, um, and it's, grow, it's grown across London. I heard last week it's gone national, which is fantastic. It's won awards, won funding and those sorts of things. Um, but in terms of sort of driving innovation, for, for the NHS, funding something like that is kind of unheard of. Like the NHS will buy like a healthy weight management service or, you know, pay for those sorts of interventions. But to like seed fund a new social enterprise is like, you know, that's like, it might not sound that innov innovative to to, us, to uh, those in business, but that's really, really exciting um, and new. And so there's a new kind of business coming out there, but there's also a new way of commissioning and buying and funding. And now we've got this success example that we can put out there, look at and point to it mm -hmm. and say, look, if we do things in different <coughs> ways, we can create sustainable ways of tackling this problem that isn't just buying more services when we've got not a lot of money to do it. So yeah, I, I think it's really about, <coughs> I suppose, in short, I think it's about proving, like design can help you prove that we can do things differently. Um, that, that's an amazing story and, and outcome, right? Um, and I think it's something that we can all relate to uh, and understand. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the process of getting there, right? Because when we hear the term design thinking, sometimes, you know, people have these, um, you know, some misconceptions around, you know, it's, it's the, it's the one size fits all, it's a magic wand, it kind of creates, you know, these great solutions or outcomes. Mm. Um, but it's, it's quite a simple, you know, process really. So uh, and maybe I'm naive in saying that because I'm a designer as well and I'm formally okay. trained, but maybe both of you, um, if you could kind of talk about the actual process itself, just a little bit for, for the audience, especially if anybody um, isn't familiar with design thinking, just, um, so we get a sense in of what's example. involved. In that example would be great. And then, Samantha, yeah. if yeah. you have an example or your own kind of takes on that as well, it'd be great. OK, so I, so, um, I kind of skipped over the process uh, because tech, if you write it down on paper, it's relatively simple. Like, do some research, do some understanding, really understand the problem, bring it back in, define it, and then develop a range of solutions, test those, and then go with the one that works. Relatively simple in practice. It's quite it can be quite hard and um there's lots of challenges and bumps to overcome and um in this instance uh we spent a lot of time with people and with families understanding things so there's lots of really understanding the challenge firsthand but we also looked at a lot of data came back reframed the challenge and problem but you've got all your stakeholders then involved saying 
uh, this is the problem when actually they've known they've thought the problem was something else for a very long time you know so there's lots of managing of all the different mm. I suppose that's probably the challenge mm -hmm. um, and if so if a group of people or an organization or a business are going on this journey for the first time you probably you can probably predict a couple of weeks before okay they're going to have a panic at this point because um, they're going to think we're not actually we don't know where we're going and uh, I feel uncomfortable about that and I want to know what the business case is at this point and it's too early um, so anyway we understand the problem then we brought lots of different people together so children families teachers policy makers commissioners a whole range of people to co-design different ideas um, in workshops we often do that um, what we find is people are quite good at coming up with ideas but they're not, not often very very different it might be they've seen it somewhere else so it might not be like like really innovative but they're nuggets and seeds of things that we can then take and work up and I think out of that came three different things that we tested uh, some of them were quite some of them were like a hot tuck food shop outside of school you know it's not that it's mm. perhaps not that different but um, quite a nice impact um, and then one of them was make it and then one of them was a information service um, and actually only two of those still are still going so two out of three which I think isn't a too bad hit rate um, but one of them d it doesn't exist anymore and it didn't work and that's also important that we tested tried failed early on a, on one of those one of them is doing okay and one of them's gone national so um, you know they're not all singing um, examples of success and I think that's also mm. important to yeah. be able to fail and you know, still, still a start, still a startup. This yeah. business, you know, it's not <laughs> a given that that's that's it for forever. But mm. so, really, um, for for that kind of example, there, it's it's highly iterative, right? Yes. So you're you're constantly testing, bringing in new people, new ideas, prototyping, right? So mm -hmm. um, I think maybe that's a a really nice way of of kind of positioning it, right? Is that it's this ongoing, you know, process or mindset or way of of working, mm -hmm. right? Um, doesn't doesn't just end when you have the first idea, right? Because it yeah. might not be the best idea. So that's really interesting. Samantha, do you have um, an example that you could maybe talk about, or what is your kind of take on design thinking? Yeah, definitely. So the first thing for me, when um, I've been working as a user researcher coming up to ten years, and the first thing I saw was there was a real difference between what I call transformation projects and innovation projects. So if you're coming into um, a company where you've got an existing service and it's sort of a legacy one, right? So they've been offering the service for a really long time. Um, and they're wanting to try and bring that into the future or bring that into the present, you start having some of the challenges, as you're saying, from some of the stakeholders having just like small ideas. Whereas I think if you're looking at something from scratch and you're really being able to build it on uh, brand new technology, in a way it affords you more space to, I think, use design thinking to really um, completely change a frame, right? And the way I look at it is instead of moving the needle within a frame, which you might do with transformation, you get to completely shift where the frame is. And that's, for me, again, where design thinking really allows us to do that. Um, so a nice example from Monzo, for example, um, is um, around a feature that we recently released called POTS. So what we were hearing from um, customers and everyone actually who um, manages their finances is that when they open up their current account, they then go and open up separate savings accounts where they funnel in money that they don't want to touch. Mm -hmm. So for example, I spoke to one family who go to Glastonbury every year, um, but because they're quite a large family and they're on, a, they're on an average income, um, they need to be really careful about the way that they save for Glastonbury every year. So what they'll do is they'll have their primary account from which their mortgage comes out, from which they pay um, their bills, and then they go and open up these separate savings accounts. And people put different amounts of friction uh, between them and their money to make sure that they don't touch that money, right? So sometimes it's within the same bank. So I'm going to open up a couple of savings accounts so that I can move money to and from. But sometimes it's with an entirely separate one <laughs> to make sure that, you know, come December I don't accidentally, or not accidentally, but decide to pull some across for, um, you know, a few more gifts. So something that we wanted to implement within Monzo was making sure that we had that facility in a way that was really quick to create, um, potentially not as quick to withdraw the money from, um, but in a way that people could still have an overview of their finances. Because another thing that we heard from people is having all these different savings accounts across different um, banks meant that they didn't always have a view of actually what all their finances looked like. So people almost forgot about these accounts that they'd created and they had you know, a few thousand pounds sitting in them or that had had a few hundred pounds and then the interest had accumulated over a few years. And you think, that's crazy, right? It's 2018 and people don't know where all their money is. Mm -hmm. Especially in a time when you know, austerity is, mm -hmm. is where it is and all the cuts are being made. Um, if we can help people manage their money better, their finances better, we want to do that in one way or another. 
Um, so POTS, as I mentioned, was um, a feature that we created off the back of design thinking, off the back of doing lots of qualitative interviews um, and also getting feedback. And the way that we do it at Monzo is we've got lots of different streams where we can get insight in. We've got a very engaged community forum, which is amazing because we can put out ideas um, and then as soon as something's been released, we can also get some feedback through there. There's an in-app chat where people can go and um, get help with any queries that they have, but they also feed back a lot of ideas through that. Um, and the customer operations team will immediately feed those ideas back to the product and design teams. Um, and then finally, there's um, qualitative and quantitative research that I've been leading while, while I've been there. I think that's, um, that's a really good point, actually, to make, is that uh, feedback and, and interaction with the people that you're, you're designing for or you're working with, whether it's stakeholders or the end user or the customer, right? Um, that is... That's the essence of design thinking, right? It's, it's trying to solve a problem for a person or innovate for, for that, that human being, right? Um, it's human-centered design process. So I think that's a really important kind of takeaway and thing to, to note as well is that it is that interaction. It's about bringing in insights in from all of these different strands and these networks as well. And also on your point at the beginning about sort of innovation or transformation, once, once the innovation is live, then it's about... Keep it, keeping it up to date and transforming mm -hmm. it uh, alongside the world that we live in. So I suppose whatever ha you're, you're always going to have those yeah. two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Samantha, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the product strategy at Monzo mm -hmm. and how design thinking is being used, you know, specifically around that to drive, you know, the strategy of the of the product um, as opposed to. The, the final solution with the end user. Yeah, that's a really good question. And at the moment. Um, Monza has been going through an interesting um, time because the way it started off was very much a proof of concept around the prepaid card. So we launched a prepaid card um, to see what the interest was, to see um, how well it got taken up. Uh, and in a way, Monza has been a little bit of a victim of its own success because we were expecting this time um, three years ago, which is, we're about to hit our third birthday, uh, we were expecting to have about 30,000 customers and we've got half a million. Um, so what's that meant? what that's meant is our unit economics have just been taken a bit of a hit mm. um, and we've spent a lot of time over the last few months needing to move everyone onto a current account um, just to make sure that we could um, keep going in the right direction. So uh, for any Monzo customers, hopefully there's some here, um, you will have noticed that things have been a little bit slow recently, um, but I'd like to firstly reassure everyone that's about <laughs> to change. Um, and then secondly, around the design thinking, around the strategy and where we're going, um, it's yeah one of the, the difficulties, again, I think for um, a startup is where we need to be careful about making sure that we're going in the right direction, but we also need to sort of fix our unit economics. Mm -hmm. um, so how's it being driven at the moment? We've always said that we wanted to be the best current account in the world. Um, so we're, we're trying to focus on that, right? We're trying to bring those features again, coming back to that point around empathy and experimentation that we know that people want to be able to do. Um, so POTS being one of them. And the next things that we're looking at are the problems that people have talked about. Um, so things around their breakdown, the breakdown of their spending. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, in one of the tabs in Monzo, you can see where you've been spending your money. So when you use your card out and about, yeah, you have like a list of all the transactions that you've been using. But in the next tab, you get a real um, detailed breakdown of where your money is actually going. And what's nice about that is for anyone who really struggles with their money, and we're hearing this coming out a lot, a lot of people who feel like they want to be able to live the life that they feel they should have. But they may be quite young, so they don't have the amount of income that would you know, allow them to live the life they want to live in London, for example, where coffee costs you know, three pounds. And it's just very easy to swipe right, and use your contactless without even realizing how much money you're spending. Um, so one of the things that Monzo does is it has real-time notif notifications mm -hmm. to increase that awareness. And the second thing is within this breakdown, uh, you can go um, at any point into the app and you can see where you're spending the most money. Um, so this was something that we keep hearing from customers uh, is really important. So we're actually going through the process of redesigning that right now. Okay. Um, our Android app is a little bit behind the iPhone app, so we want the focus to be on that. Yeah. Uh, and knowing that this is like a real area for Monzo customers, we're pushing that next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, back, sorry, it comes back to listening to what people are saying. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's kind of getting that feedback of continuous conversation right with the customer and then you're able to kind of um, drive your product decisions uh, based on, on on their needs right um, and their feedback which is is really um, critical to design thinking being successful in a business um, 
And I think there was something interesting before we started this. We we're having a conversation about culture. Um, and maybe I, I'm just going to bring that in here as well, because um, you know, we talk a lot about, or we have talked a lot about um, design thinking you know, for business outcomes or solutions, right? So whether it's an app or um, a product strategy or a service. Uh, but it's also uh, about building culture, right? So transformation was mentioned as well. And I've been um, you know, working in IBM and using design thinking, yes, to, to deliver great outcomes, whether it's services or products. But actually, what it has done is because of the way it, it operates, right? You bring diverse groups of people in to collaborate. Um, you know, you prototype, you iterate, you listen to people. It starts to create a very unique way of working, um, and a culture emerges out of that. So maybe if we could just touch on that a little bit um, around kind of your experience, whether it's you know your own culture in us creates for you, Zoe, mm -hmm. or the culture that you see you know other companies that you've been working with and clients that may not exist, but through design and design thinking, you see it there um, okay. from your perspective. Um, so internally, so our, our own culture at Us Creates, um, probably like half of us are traditionally design trained, and then the other half come from lots of different backgrounds. But I'd say design is part of the DNA. Like we, we actually, it's just the way we work. We don't know necessarily that we're doing it. It's just the way that we work. And um, I suppose that the way I'll tell you, I'll t tell the story about um, my sort of real learning about that was when um, we were thinking about our business and uh, our work, we were in a workspace um, office and the lease was coming up and we thought, well, maybe we don't need, maybe we, you know, now, this was a few years ago, maybe we don't need an office, maybe we can all work remotely, save us some money. Um, so what we decided to do is hand over the um, office to a startup for two weeks, so we kind of locked away anything important, um, handed it over, gave all of the team some budget to go and work from coffee shops and things like that, gave them a few tips and went, okay guys let's try this let's prototype this can we work remotely will this work um and after the first week i sort of had a check-in with people how's it going and they were like loving it they were loving working in their pajamas going here doing that like fitting it around their life um and the second week um it was i mean there was a few challenges around printing and stuff but that's not insurmountable. <laughs> um but the second week um i checked in with everybody and people were unhappy stressed um you know, they wanted to be, to, they were trying to meet together on, in places where they could all be together. Um, and what I really learned from that was the importance of culture within our organisation and that that is about some of the time us being together, not all of the time, but um, it's mm -hmm. absolutely key and we feed off each other and um, we, you know, we, you know, we sort of have similar values and we hire for those values <coughs> and it's about being together. So obviously we then renewed our lease in another um, workspace and uh, work together and and we we work on we work with clients on site but we never have people going on site for three months at a time or full or five days a week because it's so important that we come back and build and feed that culture mm -hmm. um, and then and then for clients um, similarly the value of design and design thinking is is really like now everybody's kind of seeing it and getting it and wanting a bit of it and sometimes they might try and sort of plug it in i'll just bring a service designer in or i we will do this thing and you know and and i don't think you can plug it in you have to sort of grow it it has to come from the top it has to come from expertise and it has to kind of filter out yeah. amongst the team yeah so. yeah i think that's um the story about your own team is is a really lovely story because especially in a creative um environment or when you're you're working with design thinking it is about bouncing off each other right it, it's about bringing in diverse perspectives and different ideas right mm -hmm. um and without that synergy it's and it doesn't always have to be in person right um you know there there are many remote teams as well but it's still it's still coming together um and and working out these problems or coming up with these new ideas so i think that that in itself that culture is really important and it does take time right mm -hmm. you can't just plug it in and expect it to work um so samantha at monzo you know it's, it's an, a new company it's very young uh, so in terms of that culture is could you maybe talk a little bit about that and does design thinking play a role in creating or sustaining that I'd say it's almost the other way around. So I'd say that the culture um, really helps design thinking thrive. 
um, as individuals, we're really empowered to just come up and go with ideas, to coming back to that point about innovation and around experimentation. And there really isn't at all a blame culture. Equally, there's no, um, there's really a sense that like as an individual, you can, you can try anything you want. And if we fail, if we make an error, that's fine because we'll learn from it and then we'll bounce from it. And I've seen a few instances where, you know, something has gone wrong. And instead of, you know, someone being pushed in a corner or like fingers being pointed, it's all about never mind what happened. Um, let's move on, move on and try and um, improve on it and let's try and fix it. And everyone really rallies together. And that's like, it really feels, this is going to sound super cheesy, but it really feels like you're working with a family and like you're working with friends. Uh, and I think that's super important for everyone. And every time um, Monzo wants to implement like a new process or do something different and try and get some um, feedback from the rest of the team, the first question they always ask is how can we make this as, like remove all the stress as possible. Sorry, that wasn't a very good sentence. <laughs> How can we make this as little stressful? Oh, that's not a good sentence. <laughs> as easy as possible? That's what we're like. <laughs> like, it's all about removing like the stress, right? And making it like a smooth and easy for everyone. Um, so I think, yeah, empowering individuals. Um, so it's not always about um, leadership. Because often, and this is a thing when I worked at big corporates, like I work at Tesco and Aviva, people always talked about leadership. Like, oh, we don't have you know, a clear vision. We don't have clear leaders. You don't need those if you've got a team of people who feel like they're equals and who are all rallying around an idea and who feel like they can really go for things. Um, even like yesterday, so we've got a Slack channel, again, this is going to sound really cheesy, called um, Feedback. And if you've received really great feedback, you post that in, or you can if you want to, post that in the Slack channel. So um, we had one of our um, uh, team members, who's actually the head of Data Insight yesterday, who posted, in, not in Gratitude, that's another channel, who posted in Feedback um, that Jonas, who's um, one of our co-founders, had pointed out to him the fact that he kept interrupting um, one of the, the new um, ladies on his team who was presenting at the Exco um, meeting. And uh, Jonas had said to him, look, Dimitri, every time you interrupt someone or you add to their ideas, it stops them from leading. It makes them follow because they're just expecting you to take over every time. I mean... How wonderful is that? You know, mm -hmm. I sort of came away from that and went, that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So that transparency, that culture kind of emerges about sharing. So again, it's feedback between employees and, and colleagues, right? Which is really and, interesting. And not interrupting and allowing people with their thoughts, with their ideas to go for things, to try them, to not squash them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always need to come top down. Yes, it helps, right? I used to really think like, oh, you have to have a champion. You have to have someone on the on the board who believes in it, who gets it, who's a designer, who's a... And it helps, but I think um, more than anything, it's about them recognizing it and about empowering everyone mm -hmm. to try things. And again, coming back to that point about moving the needle, it's not always about moving the needle. It's not always about having something that's quantifiable, you know? And I think that's what makes it difficult in mm -hmm. some places. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm, I'm just sort of um, guessing here, but also supporting that culture is the fact that you're trying trying things early and so so if you are trying something and it goes wrong you know it's not like you're going to share everybody's data or so you know something terrible that is not okay just to go oh fine doesn't matter if you fail like it's small iterative safe fa like successes or failures rather than um oh my god exactly the company's going under or, or something terrible mm -hmm. like that which is so it's the kind of the process and the approach with the supporting culture coming together. And to come with some examples around, around that that I can provide. Um, so two things that we've been doing, I think, really well at Monzo around early experimentation. The first is if the product team have got uh, an idea around something that they want to release, we first release it to really small groups of people. So we'll release it almost to like a beta group, right? And then just see how they get on with it, get lots of feedback through the community, um, through again the in-app chat. Sometimes it's even like personal phone calls to people around sample groups, around specific products, especially if we know they're gonna have a really big impact on people and their finances. So overdrafts and loans, for example, that's a space that we're gonna start going into. We wanna make sure we're doing that properly. There's been so much bad rep you know, against a lot of the banks, understandably around irresponsible lending. We don't wanna do that, right? We don't want to make money from people's misery. For us, it's all about helping people, mm -hmm. even in a way if we end up making a loss, mm -hmm. because we really believe in putting the customer first, and that's one of our core values. So that's one technique. The other technique, um, before we've even built something, is around doing user testing. So as soon as I joined Monzo, the first th one of the first things I implemented was a regular cadence 
of um, testing. I call it Testing Tuesdays because it's catchy. <laughs> People will remember it. <laughs> no, but it's more than that. It's also because if we do testing on a Tuesday, <laughs> if we do testing on a Tuesday, it gives us Wednesday to iterate. <laughs> And the catchiness is... <laughs> <laughs> That's my marketing yeah. point. <laughs> um, so that if we do four-day testing on a Tuesday, we can iterate on the Wednesday, and then we can do like pop-up testing or guerrilla testing or corridor testing or whatever you want to call it, testing on a Thursday. So within a week, to your point, we'll have come up with an idea. We'll have... Um, no, it takes us two weeks, actually. But within two <laughs> weeks, we'll have come up with an idea, prototyped a few different versions, decided which ones we're going to go with, you know, put something in Marvel or in Vision or um, whatever prototyping tool we're using done a full day of testing with some participants that will have been recruited to a very specific brief and make sure we're speaking to the right people. And then again, like mm -hmm. done some iterative testing on the Thursday. And great, like from there, mm -hmm. but we can then pass that to the product team, they build it, done. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, so far we've, we've talked about it being this iterative <coughs> prototyping sort of way of working, right? Design thinking, um, the feedback, listening to users, delivering um, and testing. Um, creating a sense of culture right across uh, your team and an organization. Um, there's also then this element of storytelling and, and both of you have been sharing really great stories about you know, where you see successes and things that you're working through. So maybe we could actually talk about storytelling and maybe talk about how storytelling, um, why it's a powerful tool within design thinking mm -hmm. and particularly for businesses. Uh, so if, again, if you have any stories about storytelling, stories about storytelling, um, really interesting to hear. Okay, so um, story. So, so I think storytelling is really powerful, and probably it, bec well, because it inspires people, and, and part of a designer's role, or, or if you're leading change or making change happen, is about bringing people on, along the way with you. As an aside, I think as a term. Businesses don't like storytelling, like it just sounds fluffy and, mm -hmm. you know, yep. um, so that's a challenge, but I don't know how to solve that one. Um, uh, but um, we use it a lot. So um, when we are trying to understand uh, people and what makes them tick, we can um, we might have a lot of big data that tells us this or that. But it's often the stories that kind of really help us understand why and get, and gather people around a challenge and a problem. Um, so there's one about like communicating what's going on and the challenge or problem, but then there's inspiring people about what's possible for change and like where we can go with things and envis envisaging a different future. Um, so we've done, we do lots of stuff in healthcare and like health is changing fast, but it can be really difficult to think about like what healthcare might be like. We work for a big private healthcare organizations talk about like robots delivering your healthcare. people are like yeah whatever that's not gonna you know but it's, it's it's already happening and it's not far away um and to get a group of kind of managers who are spending like every day in hospitals kind of with pe like people handing over checks or wad wadges of money we're still at that stage to think about robots delivering care is quite it's quite a challenge, but through stories and telling stories about what that experience might be like and how we, we created animations and created storyboards. Then people are like, oh, okay, mm. I can see how our service can be better. Um, and this might not just be a scary kind of robot or whatever delivering our care. And we also, again, I keep going on about us creators, but you know, <laughs> it's my company, so I like <laughs> talking about it. Um, we use it to think about um, our business too. So um, recently this year, uh, we've created future artifacts about um, so we've got a, a bit of a mission, we're a social design agency, we want to kind of build the blueprint for a scalable company. Um, but we don't quite know what that looks like yet. So um, our innovation guys created um, some artifacts from the future about what, so a Wired article from 2025 that talks about us creates as a global agency, like testimonials from our clients in the future about what we've done and, and where we're going to be that we think is, yeah, we want, we want that, that's where we want to go. Um, and we, in our board meetings, we put them in the middle of the table. And if we need to make a decision, it's like, well, is it going to get us there? If not, then let's mm. not do it. Let's do something else. So really sort of telling, bringing to life possible futures, I think, is really yeah. powerful and exciting. It's really interesting, actually, <clears throat> just that story itself. Um, it's very inspirational, right? And it's, you're kind of, you're shooting for that, that you know, experience that you desire. How are you going to get there? Right? Yeah, Nobody we don't really know. Knows, at least right? we all know yeah. 
how we can work together to absolutely. try and get there. It's a shared vision, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, well, these are the, the tactical steps that we're going to take because that's where you explore that. So um, that's really interesting. And, and I think definitely storytelling is, is really great at, at helping businesses um, think about their future state, right? And then, you know, go off and, and figure out the technical kind of uh, foundation for that. But um, so that's a, that's a really great story. Um, and Samantha, how about you? How, how do you see storytelling, um, I guess, driving business in Monzo or just, you know, as a, as a researcher as well and, mm -hmm. and talking to, to people? Uh, how do you use storytelling? Yeah, I completely agree with the points um, made there. I think it's completely about the vision, it's completely about inspiring, and you do that, I think, through um, understanding the emotion, because that's what makes us human, right? It's the emotion, and if you can bring that to life, I think that's really what tends to drive people. I mean, we've seen, you know, we've, there's been a lot around, like, journalism, like, recently, right, in the news, around, like, the way people are um, making decisions, and the way they, like, stick to, like, one camp or something, or, like, the biases that they already have. Mm -hmm. And the only way people really change their minds around things, we know it's not with hard facts or figures, that emotional, it's an emotional uh, driver, right? You have to tap into people's emotions. So if you want people to step up, to listen, mm -hmm. to really hear what you've got to say, it's all about that story. A, as I said, I keep coming out to this point about emotion and empathy. Uh, the second one is it's about context. Um, I think um, a lot of people in organisations, you get so stuck at looking at your product and you forget about the fact that people use it amongst other things. You get really focused about you know, the details of, you know, this is the thing we're doing and this is where we want to go, that actually bringing to life like, the context in the outside world can really help. And that's, again, where storytelling, I think, can bring that richness that you sometimes miss when mm -hmm. you just not you don't have that context. Yeah, absolutely. I love that um, the emotional kind of value that storytelling brings. Um, I think it's also a really great way to, um, and this is purely from a kind of large corporation. Um, it's a really great way to get buy-in and support from from business leaders, right? Because um, if you can express uh, through storytelling why you're doing something or why design is a value or why you should you know trust design thinking or take um that leap of faith with with a process that is really intangible and and kind of uh for a non-creative person i believe everybody's creative this is why i'm using those little fingers there um <laughs> but but a lot of executives or business leaders um believe that you know design thinking because it's it's the formalization of a designer's workflow is that it's it's not for them, right? But actually, it's for everyone, and everybody can tap into it. And I found that storytelling is a really great way to kind of provide that insight and um, tapping into the emotional kind of uh, side of things, and that it is that human element that really drives uh, that way of working. Um, so I think you know, from my perspective, I think storytelling is really good to get business leaders bought into this idea of trusting design or or, or looking at design as a way of of leading business outcomes. Um, what other sort of, pro oh, do you want to Can weigh in there? Can I just add one bit to that though? Because yeah, just my comment about, I was just thinking about my comment about storytelling being like not a very businessy word. And we've been talking about quite creative, kind of like designerly ways of telling stories, but I don't think it's always that, it doesn't always have to be a film or a, yep. a printed mm -hmm. thing or a beautiful thing. Like you can tell stories through numbers and you can tell like, so if, you know, if a, senior leader, like if that's how they think, it, you can tell the story through a kind of pro a forecast or a project projection or like, it doesn't just have to be through like creating storyboards. It's thinking about the kind of narrative and how and, um, and grounding it in some kind of possible future that inspires yeah. people. So I think just because it doesn't have to be like traditionally creative, you can be creative in how you can communicate and tell stories. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually. Um, and I think I'm glad that you, you brought that up because um, it doesn't have to be this high fidelity animation Much video. Much diagrams. Absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's about expressing mm -hmm. um, the, the experience or the essence of it. So I think uh, that's actually really important. And to be honest, um, we do that more than <laughs> the nice, shiny storytelling kind of outcomes. Uh, it is a very quick, you know, rough and ready post-it sketch or, you know, using words or just somebody telling um, a really interesting sort of um, story. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that call out. And, and, and so then storytelling is maybe one way of, of getting business leaders to think about design thinking and implement design. 
um, in their business. What other sort of processes or strategies do you see or do you think that business leaders specifically um, could actually you know, implement in their own organisations? So Samantha, do you have any insight there? Um, yeah, that's it's a, it's an interesting question. Uh, the one thing I try and always get people to do, so I'll talk about this very personally, is try and get them down to either the lab or try and get some video clips in front of them from user, te user testing. So user testing, even though it's not that great at telling stories because it's all about tactical changes more than anything because it's quite late on in the process, right? It's an evaluative research method. The second that you get business leaders to actually see a video clip or to actually get them in the lab and they hear something coming out of a customer's mouth, completely changes them. Mm -hmm. And I really like using that as almost just this way, this like nugget of like, oh, you just give me half an hour of your time. I'll just watch this one video that's yeah. like two and a half minutes long that I'll have made of the video clips. And I find, find that really, really helps. Um, and it just like, once you get one person on board, I find the whole thing just cascades, like mm. it really helps. Absolutely. Um, I suppose I'd say that if I was going to do one thing or if as a small business owner or a big business owner, it's just to start, just to try something different try it test it you know like run the meeting in a different mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. next time or have a different interact like interaction or answer the phone in a different way or double your rates for one pitch or like just like do one thing differently and learn from it like you might get paid double double the rate or you might not but <laughs> at least you at least you kind of know um, yeah. <laughs> where, where where you sit with it so i suppose it's like Te try something, test it, do it again. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Sorry. The other point I was going to say is um, try and focus on the why. I think so many businesses focus on the what, like, oh, this many customers said this, or this many did this, like, hear the charts, hear the numbers, understand the why. And if you understand the why, again, everything will start flowing from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think actually um, it's, a, it's a great point of the why because, you know, we were speaking earlier about everybody wants design and design thinking is cool, right? And it's, it's the buzzwords that we, we read about and we hear about and we're all here talking about it today. Um, but asking, you know, well, what, what will it do for our business or why would we want to implement design mm -hmm. and design thinking is really important because, again, if you force that um, without understanding the value of it, uh, it could be, you know, very damaging yeah. to your business, your culture, again, and those outcomes that you're trying uh, to create, right? So asking that, that why, and I think starting small um, and doing something really small, like having a meeting in, in a different way. Um, we've definitely, we, 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 a couple of years ago when I joined IBM, um, our teams, like they're huge and we're spread all across the world. Uh, and I remember I was working on a, a product with a team. We were split between Israel, Australia, China, Ireland, um, America and the UK. So impossible <laughs> to get on the phone. But when we were on the phone, there was no sense of trust or uh, we didn't really know each other, but we were having these very corporate calls. Um, and then gradually, you know, uh, people wouldn't turn up or they wouldn't be listening. And so we changed that, right? And we started thinking, well, okay, well, how could we use design thinking to, to maybe um, improve the way we work together? And so we started using video call I mean, that's, it's not you know, rocket science, but it was something that we never did before. And some of the engineers in that team had been working together for 10, 15 years. They'd never seen each, each other, right? <laughs> that is a true story. They'd never seen each other because they were always emailing or on a phone call. Um, and so by actually introducing that element of we are humans and you know, we can have that interaction, it completely flipped the dynamic. And then we started moving into using things like Neural, right? So for those of you who um, maybe haven't heard of it, it's, it's basically like a virtual whiteboard. It's um, an in-browser tool and allows you to essentially run like kind of workshops, but on a screen. And so you have little post-it notes and markers. And we, we gradually got to that stage by doing these small incremental changes. Um, and the goal was to use and implement design thinking, right? But to get to that point, we couldn't just inject it in mm. because it would be rejected. Uh, and so we had to gradually change that. Mm. And, and I think the what, again, just building on the why, like what, so if you may be design leaders or you may be wanting to bring design into your organization, but um, unless 
you understand like why why would it be a good thing mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know like is it that change isn't happening fast enough is it that customers aren't happy like what like what is the value because that's what people are going to care about so yeah. really thinking yeah. that through. And it might seem kind of obvious but it's but it often isn't yeah taking that step back mm. is actually sometimes really mm. difficult right um so my final question uh and then we'll open it up to the floor uh, is really you know um what area do you both of you see design thinking having the most significant impact and by area you can take that um, you know it could be a field discipline or technology um, um, so the so as a social design agency I really think um, design thinking and solving important tricky social challenges and problems is I mean there's not there are some other great companies working mm -hmm. in this area but I can't see it happening at scale at the moment and it's kind of my mission is to build a business that can impact at scale, use design to help solve these problems um, at a different sort of level and scale. So that's that's my hope yeah. and dream. Yeah, amazing. Um, I think across the services, like the service industry mm. as a whole. Um, so I think technology is caught up in a way that means that a lot of competitors are offering very similar offerings. Mm -hmm. So it's all about design to differentiate yourself and to be able to um, provide a user experience that people are going to want to come back to every time because it's not just about that first experience anymore, it's about the continuity, the loyalty, the being able to iterate, optimise um, on what people have experienced once and then you know, keep making them want to come back for more. So I think generally it's yeah. just going to keep. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think this idea of services, right, again, that, that really touches on the heart of design thinking being human focused, right? It's about people. So from a social um, context, you know, you're, you're solving problems for people. Yeah. Um, real problems, right, uh, or innovating in a space where um, people are going to benefit, right, and yeah. that's that's really inspiring, and, and um, you know, it's inspiring for me as a designer as well to think about uh, how that can actually be used to change people's lives, which is, uh, you know, kind of sounds uh, quite weighty, but actually you can. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you so much for both of your uh, insights. Um, I think we'll we'll open it up to the floor if we do we have a mic or oh we do okay great so does anybody have a question um burning question for either zoe samantha or myself you do okay uh, my my only um <clears throat> interaction with monzo is uh those floral cards that i see and i'm a graphic designer and we try to convince clients to use bright colors all the time and there's always a hesitation right at the end, we pull back and use something else, unless it's a cultural client. And to me, those numbers that you have, I think probably have a lot to do with it. I mean, I see it all day. I see a couple of Monzo cards a day. So you, you would register that, and what is that? And who, you know, I mean, how did that decision come about? And do you register that on impact? Yeah, so that was a very conscious decision that was made by our team um, who wanted it to be different. Um, and they also recognised that Monzo was a lot more than just the app. Um, so they were considering the card and looking at the touch points and they felt that they wanted to do something that people would, would want to, to bring their cards out, right? They wouldn't be embarrassed um, about. I, I know that personalisation of cards was like a big thing a few years ago. I don't know if everyone remembers there was a certain <laughs> bank who shall not be named um, who <laughs> allowed you to print like certain photos. And actually people thought it was a really good idea, but then I don't know if you saw any of your friends or colleagues do this, they'd print it and then they were really embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a nice idea, but then they never actually ended up, I think, taking off in the way it had been imagined. Mm -hmm. Um, so something we wanted to do with the cards was have a card that people felt proud of and that people felt like it was, you know, it's part of the identity of the bank, right? It's part of the identity of, of the, the company. So that was a, a very conscious decision around, uh, around the card. And um, many discussions were had as to whether it should be matte or shiny. Mm -hmm. um, we would, again, we would order about 10 different versions of, to someone who's maybe non-creative, the same thing, right? <laughs> and we would scrutinize them and we'd spend a really long time looking over them. Even the way that the MasterCard logo would appear on the card, like the, the, the detailing around you know, how well it bled into it and how it kept, like the colors kept and how true they were. It turns out printing neon cards is really difficult and getting them like to really match the color is extremely difficult. Um, so I'd say, yeah, it was a very conscious decision. Was there ever any hesitation? Around? That color? <clears throat> 
Yeah, there was, so um, they looked at hot pink. So this one's hot coral, um, and the name of the little um, icon is called Hot Chip. <laughs> uh, so it's really sort of fed into the whole identity of the brand. Um, hot, yeah, hot pink was looked at at one point, and then we had like a hot, a few hot other colors. Oh, another question. Uh, hi, uh, my question was more about prototyping and design thinking. So if you're ideating and you have a bunch of ideas, but you have certain constraints, whether that's uh, financial money or, or other resources, how do you decide which direction to go if, say, there were three or four prototyping ideas that you could technically go with, but you needed to make a decision sooner? Um, well, I mean, I'd say you, that you can prototype so quickly and easily and cheaply in like really low fidelity prototypes. You can draw, I don't, I mean, I don't know if, what, what sort of product or service, but you can draw it out and get people to pretend to press stickers. You can role play it, you can draw it. There's like initial early stage prototyping. Cost shouldn't be a challenge or an issue. And then as you understand it more and you can, you can build up the fidelity of those prototypes. So um, I, I would prototype as many as you think have legs and then start to filter and, and, and refine. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with Zoe. So one of the big things of prototyping is making sure that you have the right level of fidelity for what it is that you want to test. Um, so if you're looking at flows, you can really be about boxes and arrows, and that you can do on paper. Um, if it's on mobile, what I've seen done before, which was really nice, is they created like a, um, like a, a sort of cardboard frame with like a long roll of paper that you could just draw and then you could get people to physically pull it through and sort of play around with it. And you can have a sort of Wizard of Oz, Oz me methodology where if they pretend to tap on something, you can then take them down different paths or different routes mm -hmm. just using paper. Um, if you want to have something that's slightly more, um, you know, slightly higher fidelity, there's loads of tools again where you can basically take those and then just turn them into a clickable flat mm -hmm. prototype. Um, so as to your question around which one do you go for, so yeah, sometimes there's no right answer, mm. right? You just have to go with um, what it is that you want to do and what you think will be the best solution at that point. And sometimes it becomes about A-B testing um, because of user testing, as you know, you can't really run you know, tons of different um, prototypes with a sample of you know, five, six people, even if you're doing it over multiple um, days or multiple iterations. Um, so generally, I think you have to ask yourself the question, like, what is it that we're actually trying to change? Is it just a button or two? Is it just around labeling? Because then you can get a feel during the sessions, and then it becomes more about A-B testing further down the line. If you're looking at a completely fundamental different way of um, organizing the flow, then that should come out in the, in the user testing. And what I would recommend is if you are looking at multiple versions in user testing, try and only stick to two or maximum three and have them at real opposite ends of what you're testing. Because if all you're testing is minor changes, people don't notice. They just want to complete their task, right? They just want to get through the flow. Um, so just changing one thing here or there that for us is a really big decision, people just don't realize. Follow up to that is just um, what about when customers don't know what they want? So I'm just thinking the instance of New Coke, for example, and the disaster where they feel tested and everyone apparently loved it and you roll it out. So in that instance, what would the design thinking answer be? Yeah, so for me, I don't ask people what they want. I look at what they do. Um, you, from the essence of design thinking is about that. Like People aren't designers, we're the designers. We're the ones who need to have the confidence that we're coming up with a solution that meets their needs. Um, so that would kind of be it. So like I've, I've seen some really poor user research being done in the past where people would, you know, designers um, who would show um, customers, uh, you know, prototype and go, do you like this? <laughs> and, and I kind of think, well, it doesn't matter if they like it or not. <laughs> as long as they can get through it, as long as they can do the task, that's what's important. Mm -hmm. So I'd look back at the methodology that you're using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, oh. So I was going to add is that, is that thing of like iteration is the, is the why, 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 and really getting right into the depth of understanding and, and then all of a sudden you realise it's not that they want new code, they actually, they're unfulfilled in whatever, whatever the need is that they're trying to make. Precisely, yeah. Um, I think absolutely about the process there, like really that, not asking people what they want, but finding out. Um, but what they use and how it, but by, by testing, but also this is something I'm learning as I 
get more experience, but um, really trusting your designer's in, intuition, or if you're not a designer, just your intuition about what you know. You know probably your customers quite well, um, especially if you spend some time with them. And, and kind of leading the way, you know, trusting your intuition, making a creative leap, leading the way, putting something out there in the world. Like if it's going to be anything new or different, people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then safely testing and growing it. But I think intuition is a big player there. And coming on to that thing about your customers and about this having unfinished work, the whole, you know, the low fi the you know, getting stuff out there, getting feedback. How how have you found with your customers and your clients that they respond? Do they go, look, we're paying you loads of money and you're giving us a piece of toilet roll this time around? Or how do they or do you know, do people kind of are they getting it now? Do they understand that idea that stuff moves quickly? Yeah, it's, it's challenging. So when I worked agency side, it very much depended on the clients. Mm. And depending on the client that you have, you, you present things at different levels. And sometimes what we would do is we just wouldn't tell them about some of the stuff we were doing until we sort of come up with the results and go, oh, look, like this is all the, the process that we've been through because you're right, like sometimes people just don't get it. Um, but that for me is a completely, it's like another, it's a separate thing, right, about like bringing your stakeholders on board and about the, the way you communicate with them. Um, but when you do have like a, a stakeholder that gets it, then it's nice you can bring them along that process sooner. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think um, actually just um, to weigh in on that, one thing that we've definitely seen is the relationship between um, clients and and our teams have actually just improved tenfold purely because of the way design thinking um, allows people to work together. Uh, so building that rapport with each other uh, and then bringing clients in and allowing them to you know, be part of, of the creative process and sharing their viewpoints is really important. And I think um, that has definitely helped kind of, you know, they're comfortable then that they've had their say to a certain extent and that they, they feel that they've been heard um, as opposed to, you know, okay, we don't know what we're going to get back. At least it's, it's a two-way conversation, right? You're having this dialogue, which has been really interesting. At the end of the day, it is, um, whether it's the designer or um, whoever it is that's making the final outcome, um, it kind of becomes a little bit irrelevant because everybody has, has a role to play and, and has um, that kind of sense of responsibility as well, which is really interesting. The other thing I would say is um, the agencies I've seen who are the most successful at doing this are the ones that pick and choose the clients they work with. Mm -hmm. So they don't just blindly take any work and go, I'm just going to work with this client because you know it's a big name. They make sure they have the conversation. And if the client is clearly just going to not take any of it on board and you're having like those red flags from the first conversations, it's almost a battle that you know is already lost. So why would you go into it? Mm -hmm. A, a nice example that we've got at the moment. So we're working with a council on their homelessness services um, and tr prototyping and testing new services is completely new to them. So it's about building in, building capabilities as we as we go along. Um, but we've met with them the other week, and um, two of the housing officers said, um, "Right, we know we know something really really important. What we need to do is our chairs are too high." And we were like, "What what what are you talking about?" And they were like. I can't remember then, me and Kathy over lunch, like just role played, be it coming in for an assessment. And we realized that um, like one of us was towering over the person coming in, presenting as homeless. And that the, 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 you know, the kind of power that they had and how that, and that was just causing really unhelpful, non-supportive situations. So we were like, okay, fine, let's get some new chairs. You know, but they just yeah. did that. They were prototyping an interaction in their lunch break. Mm -hmm. Like without us, we weren't there going, right now, role play this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we were like, yay, <laughs> that's the biggest success yeah, of this work. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to take a couple more questions, but I'm just conscious of the time um, for those watching on Facebook. So, um, thank you to anybody who joined the live streaming. Um, we're going to continue the conversation. I know you've been dying to ask a question for a while. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you to anybody online. And if you'd like to ask that question, finally. <laughs> um, sure. Can you hear me? Um, I know, Samantha, you were mentioning uh, creating a culture where you empower people uh, to take their own actions. Could you tell a little bit more about this? Okay. Uh, maybe how to do it. How to do it. Um, so it's, 
it's kind of like a chicken and egg, right? So I think some of it does need to come from the management um, that they don't do, as I was saying, giving the example where um, one of my colleagues was always adding to what someone else was saying. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's being aware, I think, of the way that you manage your team, giving them that space to breathe, you know, not micromanaging, giving them projects that they can take away and work on. Um, and then I think as individuals, it's also about not being fearful. Um, so I think, you know, I, certainly myself when I was more junior, I was always worried that like I needed to present something that was really polished. I needed to present something that, um, you know, I'd get a pat on the back for, um, essentially. And actually, it's, it doesn't need to be about that. It can be about showing your process. And as long as you can show your thinking, even if you don't always have a solution, it's about like, yeah, about showing like how you're getting there. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? That's a bit waffly, I feel. Yeah, yeah, that, that answers my question. And um, it's very interesting because at our company, uh, we are, um, it's, they are very open for us to try different things. Mm -hmm. um, but I have exactly the same feeling a little bit like, I sometimes need a pat on the back or like mm -hmm. an encouragement or like, yeah, that was a good idea. So kind of finding this balance between having this opportunity, but also knowing that you're doing the right thing. I think something that might help you, um, that helped me when I was, um, before when I was starting out, was about finding allies and people that you feel like, if there are certain people that you don't feel like you can be completely open with, find people that you can be. Um, I find that I work really well with designers. I work very symbiotically with them. And um, designers, when they'll come up with an idea, they'll always sort of say to me, oh, Sam, can you just come over and have a look at this? And you know, I just want to pick your brains. I go, right, okay. So I'll look over at the screen. And then because they're right in the detail, I sort of give them that big picture of, oh, well, this is really nice. But actually, do you remember when we spoke to this person? Or do you remember that interview that happened? And there's this and that. And then coming back to a point about storytelling, sort of injecting some of that emotion, that context. Um, and it can work the other way around as well. So I will really often check in with my team whenever I create a new deliverable or whenever I'm about to you know, come up with an idea. I'm like, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? Does that work for you? And just about having that dialogue really early and often and feeling like you can. Yeah. Um, the other sort of Thank final you. point I'd say is if you do end up in a place where um, that's not encouraged and you do feel like it's being held against you in any way, shape or form, it's probably not the right place to be working and or bring it up to your manager and speak to them and be like, you know, I want to be somewhere where that's supported rather than somewhere where I'm going to be um, chastised for it. Thank you. Hiya. Um, my question is, um, everyone's sort of trying to disrupt or innovate in their particular area of wherever they work. And a lot of it is really vulgar and bad. Like, you know, every day I go on the tube and I see a poster that says it's like Uber, but for washing your clothes, <laughs> something like that. So um, obviously Monzo have done it in my opinion. I'm a Monzo user myself and I love it. And it's changed the way I bank and spend my money because I'm terrible at managing my money but um oh, yeah your money yeah what <laughs> um in your opinion like what is the most important element of design thinking or any other thing um to help sort of disrupt and innovate in whatever particular area that you are in i know that's a bit vague but um three things uh, empathy humility and curiosity hands wow. down <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I mean, <laughs> uh, I just think it's just the what, like, why are you doing this? Because if there's no, you know, like, do we need Uber for clothes washing? I don't know. Like, what's the, yeah. So I suppose my answer is what's, what's the need? What's the problem? What's the opportunity? Think about that first. Should we? Expand. Yes, okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, so empathy, coming back to the understanding, the context, humility. Um, so something I've seen in a not a lot of places, but in places where you know I felt like things didn't go right, is this arrogance that some designers have, and this arrogance that some product people have, just some people have, right? Um, around like this is my idea, and I wanna I wanna be seen as you know being the, the superhero, like I'm the one who owns this, and I'm the one who's gone with this idea and changed the world. And I can't remember who said this because I'm really bad at remembering quotes, the names of quotes, but I'm good at remembering what the quote says. Um, and someone said, if you want to go, as uh, go far, go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you've got to go with people. You've got to bring your team. And it's that, it's that humility. Like there's no superheroes at Monzo. Like everyone's pulled together. 
Um, we work really quickly off Slack. Like I'd say that's one of the things we do well is speed. When I first got there, I was like, wow, everything so happens so quickly. I just spent nine months in government. And uh, <laughs> where, you know, it was like, oh, I've got a thing where I might want to talk to someone. Oh, put a meeting in next week. Oh, no, wait, half a team's on holiday. Put a meeting in in two weeks. Right, OK. And then by then, you've just completely lost momentum. Whereas here, it's just like, oh, just Slack it. And then do, do, do a couple of ideas, done, right? But again, this thing of like humility, everyone's just like part of it. And then we'll pick up things and then just like go for it and drive it. And then the curiosity around, like again, sort of goes in hand with the humility and the empathy around like, I don't have all the answers. I'm not going to pretend I do. So striking that balance between confidently I'm going to push something, but also recognize that I don't have all the facts. And we're going to try. We're going to experiment. We're going to see how things go. And then sort of go from there. But I was also just thinking about your comment that it's, people are trying to disrupt and it can be vulgar. I think kind of the new and the different can be like not necessarily palatable or, you know, like, and mm. that's not always I'm a, all, a always bad through, thing. I'm all meant badly thought through. Like, okay, like, fine. Like, okay. 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 Um, we have a question here, and then we'll take the chat. Okay. We'll get. A couple of questions. One for kind of for now, and one thinking about the future. Um, so. You're undoubtedly um, experienced in working for organisations with budgetary constraints, time constraints probably as well, um, and recognising that this is an iterative process. How do you keep them informed on you know, where you are through the journey, on progress, um, what metrics do you use to report back to them, mm -hmm. how do you forecast you know, a, a, a budget to, to complete, or a time to complete? So that's one question. And then the second one is thinking into the future. How do you both see... Um, AI machine learning impacting on the processes you go through um, or design as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a whole? So on your first question about how do we, I mean, especially we work with public sector who are not always known for working at speed, but um, getting better um, and the way uh, that we work with our clients to show the progress is that we like work with them. So, uh, not that long ago, it would be like us doing a project and sending a status report to show what we've done that week and thing. Now, every day, we have clients in, in the office with us working together. Working, we work in much more agile ways and we work in sprints so that they are just coming on the journey with us. And so we don't have to do that kind of reporting, which we much prefer doing, even though we have to keep our office a bit tidier than we used to. <laughs> um, so that's the way. And but that's just, just coming and... Uh, I, it's not going to be long until we're, uh, we're all working like that, but it's slowly, slowly coming. To your question about the AI, I see AI as enhancing experiences that we can already do because it's all about machine learning and um, taking information that we have or can get to then enhance it. So I see it being as part of like the, the initial process. So, oh, we've got an idea. We want to, you know, the vision, right? We want to come up with um, a solution that solves this problem. It's just like knowing that that's almost like another trick that we've got that we can potentially integrate into a solution, um, firstly. And then secondly, around like the technical implementation, like at the end, you can also I don't know, either come up with like an experiment where you again try it with like a sample and you can see whether or not that's something that will work. Um, but I don't really see it impacting in a negative way. I just see it as like, again, enhancing what we have already and what we can do. I think as well, actually, just on that point, um, you know, AI and, and machine learning, you know, it's built on algorithms, right, and technology. But what, we're, what we do when we talk about design thinking is about creativity, right? So um, I don't think you can swap that out or replace it um, with AI, certainly not now. And I don't think um, any time in the near future at all. So I think uh, maybe our roles in terms of thinking about better ways to create AI or machine learning um, tools uh, might be a role of a designer, right? Um, or, you know, you might use design thinking to solve those kind of problems or innovate there. Uh, but I don't think it's a, it's a replacing um, what we do as, as kind of creatives, right? Um, I would feel pretty strongly about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, fingers crossed. Um, so we have a question, yeah, in the middle. Um, talking about culture and, and future, I have a question around vision, and I understand Monza vision is about um, be the best current account for people in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you 
make sure you build every day onto that vision. How do you make your team buys into this vision? How do you make sure any outcomes rely on this vision? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So in terms of making sure everyone's bought into it, everyone who's joined the company is, is bought into it. Um, I think because the company started and it's quite still quite new, everyone that's been bought in is really enthusiastic about the product. So in a way, that's already done, um, if that makes sense. And then in terms of making sure that everything that we add is incremental and builds on it, it just comes back to this point about needs. Um, so making sure that we don't get what I call like featureitis, that we're just adding stuff because someone in like some department thinks it's a good idea or you know they quite like the look of it. Um, and one of the reasons that I joined the team recently was to try and make sure that any um, insight that we do get is representative and balanced. So um, you know one of the, the things that we have from our forum is it's great because we've got a community that's very engaged but they do tend to be slightly biased in that they are early adopters and that they represent like a certain segment that might not be as diverse. Um, so how do we build on that? We want to make sure that all the features that we build are the right ones um, by speaking to people, by making sure that they're representative and then like be the usability around it is, is it always needs to be delightful. If something isn't delightful, it just doesn't make the cut. Yeah. Hi. So I work in a creative team where a lot of the time an idea or a project will come our way that's been developed by another by someone at an upper level uh, to achieve a goal of theirs, which they're maybe not approaching in the way that we would have done it ourselves. Is there a way how would you recommend that say if an idea is either not working or you think it you let it reassess it, yeah. how can you take it back to design principles and make a good case? or find another way to approach this idea while still involving those who might not approach mm -hmm. it the same way as you. Can you give an example? <laughs> <laughs> or is it sensitive? I actually I do have some people from my office in this room. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be, I'd be more, more around how to, um, like an, an, uh, an analysis process for going from, working, working back from a goal uh, um, okay, so without, uh, I'm trying to imagine the context of this, but I, it's probably like, at one level, it's, you've been given, I mean, that happens to us all the time. We get a brief for one thing, which isn't really what is needed. It's actually kind of because there's some um, understanding of a challenge and problem, this probably will work, and so can you design that thing? So really, it's about then, without <laughs> offending, like, how do you then go and interrogate that without letting people think you're going backwards. So you really need to understand the context, where this has come from, really understand the challenge. And a lot of that is through talking and unpicking and coaching through and helping those people that have come with that problem to kind of reset and look at the challenge or problem from a different perspective. Um, but there's, lo there's probably lots of different ways depending on what the example is. But I'd say it's like, positively exploring where the brief or the idea or whatever has come from to then slightly different way. Um, but sometimes people just want that thing and you have to kind of start on the journey for giving them that thing and then, actually, doesn't this look a bit better? <laughs> yeah, um, that, I've seen that done before, which works really well. Mm -hmm. um, the other one I'd suggest, uh, I was doing a bit of research last week, and I came across like Tim Cook's book from IDEO, and he talks about using a method called unfocused groups. So we mm. spend so much time like making sure that we want to design for a target demographic, which, not just demographic, a target user, which makes sense. But actually, sometimes it's good to hear about those edge cases. We don't need to spend lots of time on them, but just to have them, you know, be aware of them because they can bring some ideas. So if that's the case and you feel like you're very entrenched, take a step back. So maybe you could say to them, like, wouldn't it be great to a handful of our real edge case type users do an unfocused group? can maybe bring in some things that we hadn't considered and that might help them sort of look sideways. So the example used in the book was around um, cooking tools and they said that they were trying to design cooking tools for the sort of everyday person and, and what they did is they did a focus group with chefs and then with children because there's still people who might use tools but they tend to fall outside of like the typical remit of who they were designing for. There was another example around like shoes and they were wanting to redesign a shoe service. 
So they brought in like, um, I think it was like a limo driver who uh, differentiates himself by having these like killer stilettos. And then like, someone else who was um, like designing shoes for like children. And then again, like a few real edge cases, but that way you can get some ideas and it might help expand their view. It comes back to like innovation metrics, you know, what, what, what do you define as a, as a success metric when you're innovating? And you, is it, you know, it isn't necessarily ROI, mm -hmm. you know, it can be things like learning about your customer, how you're using your resources within your team, and, you know, a lot of other things, and maybe that comes back to the thing about how do you sell, you know, sort of innovation and more design thinking ways of working, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, mm -hmm. the, you know, top level. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'd say, don't put a pen in I made that mistake once, don't do it. <laughs> so I had a, uh, working with someone who was very senior who um, had this real pet project on something they really wanted to build. And it was just the car being passed around from one person to the next. And then I got, they were like, oh Sam, can you come in and speak with us? And they just delegated this meeting. I was like, right, okay. Um, and then I was trying to talk through like why technically just some of the stuff wasn't gonna work. Um, and they had this vision, they were like, coming back to your, your vulgarity point, they were like, oh, this needs to be like tweet deck, but for this. I just thought, this is not, it's not gonna work for like a hundred reasons. Even just technically, it wasn't gonna work on mobile, but anyway. Um, and uh, I started sketching out to like show them, to be like, oh, well, look at this, and here are some other ideas. He takes the pen out of my hand, and he starts drawing and being like, draw this, or build this. It's like a terrible idea. <laughs> just don't give a pen. <laughs> yep, question. Um. Um, what books or further reading or online um, blogs would you recommend to kind of keep exploring this topic? Great question. You, yeah. I bet you know the best one, to be honest. Um, well, okay, so um, it's a really great resource, right? So they're like, pioneer design thinking. So I would say that's a really good of a lot of um, material out there. There's a great book by um, their current CEO, Tim Brown. Um, it's Change by Design. So if you're interested in kind of organizational design, it's a really good reference. Um, so IDEO have, you know, buckets of design thinking resources. So I would definitely look there. Um, shameless uh, self plug for IBM, but actually um, IBM is completely open source, the design thinking uh, and, you know, the team have done an amazing job of, of really um, scaling design thinking for large corporations and, and um, institutes. So there's a, an entire practice for user research. If you're interested in that, there's a lot of tools um, and external uh, links and resources. So again, that's kind of public, um, which is really great. Uh, in terms of reading, I'm reading a really good book at the moment. It's called Slow Reader. Um, and it's it's about design thinking and, and it's very academic, but actually um, it's it's a really good resource. So um, I would that's a very contemporary one as well, where design thinking, um, you know, it's, it's from the early 90s, really. So people have been doing it for a long time. But in terms of contemporary resource, that's a really good book if you're interested. Just thought of a good one. So I'm, I like to do the do design a lot and I don't necessarily read that many books but this, I'm listening to a podcast series at the moment called Hurry Slowly so it's lots of the principles of it's not explicitly design thinking but it's about how can you move at pace but without rushing um, and there's loads in there all, all the sort of principles and nuggets of, and real life people talking about it and I totally they're like 20 minute things and um, it's changed, changed my life mm -hmm. so <laughs> Hurry Slowly I'd recommend. Uh, some of my favourites, uh, List Apart, Smashing Magazine, um, Boxes and Arrows is quite good just for some basics around interaction design. And then Medium, if you actually find the people that you're interested in, like some of the influencers, they put some great articles on there. You know, Jared Spool, uh, Melissa Perry from a product perspective, I've seen her speak a couple of times and she's fantastic. Um, and she really gets it, like as a, as a product person. Um, and then some of the books, I think some great mentions there. And I'm trying to think. A book apart has so many great, um, like if digital or product, um, you know, there's lots of really good resources and they're, they're short reads as well. So you can download like ebooks and, as well. The other one that's been really surprising actually is if you sign up to the mailing list from some of your favorite tools. So Trello, um, they send through like a mailing list and they sometimes have articles and they're really good. Same with um, Intercom mm -hmm. and same with, I think it was Envision as well. Um, I'd like, I read some of them and I was really surprised at how good they were. And Marvel, actually Marvel do some great writing. I've got a slide one. 
Um, if you've got a decent sized team or you work or if you work in a large organisation, there's the Stanford P School crash course on design thinking. You know, that's a video and you, you just put the video on and bring loads of old toilet rolls and plastic bottles and stuff in and, and you just make stuff and it's good fun. But it's really good way, it's a really quick way. Because first of all it demonstrates that design thinking it's, it's a bias to action, it's backwards doing stuff, getting out and doing it. There's no breaks, the thing just runs through and you just switch it on and it gets people right into that sort of mindset. Mm. Well, I've, right. I've run it a lot in a large company and it works really well. And sure. it's also things like just like that thing that is I think the first one it's that silos, breaking mm. down, it's like getting people together so people make mistakes together and they make a mess together and it kind of makes them more yeah, it builds up the trust. Yeah, really. yeah. Great. Um, do we have time for more or are we wrapping up or yeah, more. So any more questions? We still have time. Yeah, we have a question here, a second row. Um, hi, so I actually work with uh, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> Was it your idea? So, well, I hope it's, I'm the designer. Um, so uh, we work at Receipt Bank um, and we're trying to grow our research team and design team. Um, and I just wondered how you guys kind of how you've built your silos um, and how they work together with your product managers and any comments on that really? Probably best for you because yeah. I don't think we have any silos. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we've got products uh, and then we've got different teams for like the different parts of, the, of the, the app essentially. So we've got like a lending team, a partnerships team, one that's around like retention and growth. Uh, and then our design team sort of sits um, alongside, but sort of slightly, at the moment, like just the way that the layout of the office is means that it's slightly removed. But it's interesting because it's something that we've been looking at and we, we were actually talking about this last week and we we're saying that because now the design team sits together and we're in a different office, um, it means that we don't sit with the development team as much and there have been like a few issues that started coming out of that. Um, so I think what's probably going to end up happening when we move into the next office is we'll probably end up having the designers sort of co-located. Um, as the sole researcher, I just sort of float. <laughs> Whoever's got the best treats on their desks. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, um, so we, well, at the moment, I'm the only designer in Europe because um, we have a lot of remote designers, um, so in Indonesia and around the world. Um, and it really helps because we're sat right next to, well, I'm sat right next to the product managers. So I might overhear something on a call and I'll, be like, do you mind if I just scroll this? And before you know it, we've come up with a whole new product. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. I think, um, so this is a challenge that we faced um, and we still face in IBM because it's such a huge company. Um, and, you know, I spoke earlier about the size of some of our product teams and we could have a product manager in Canada and designers in Dublin and engineers in, in India. Um, that's a very, you know, typical example. And now we are moving towards this more co-located um, way of working and uh, Agile has been amazing in terms of bringing um, those groups together. Um, I think the big thing is, is the people, right? So I think starting with people and making sure that everybody understands each other and mm -hmm. their team members and their roles, uh, I think that is that will make or break the success of, of the team um, because if if somebody is in another country, it's very easy to feel cut off um, and it's very easy for them not to be able to weigh in. So if you're sitting beside your product manager, they might feel like you know they're not part of that team. So I think small uh, steps to, to make sure that everybody is is included, uh, whether that is a you know scrum in the morning with your you know your scrum master and you just you use that time to just make sure that everybody um, can talk to each other. You know, those, those small little uh, actions are really important. And then as you build that, you know, make sure to, to be very strategic and, well, okay, are we actually allowing time for us to, to just chat, to get to know each other, to make sure that everything's going okay, as opposed to just delivering all the time? Uh, because being in person, you know, body language, um, you know, counts for most of the interaction that you have. And without that, it's very hard for a team to succeed. So. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, but small things and start with the people is, I would definitely suggest that. that would be I've just got a point to add if that's okay. I've just thought of a few things that might be useful for you actually. Um, one is, so within our Slack channels, we've got a Slack channel for each one of the product teams and anyone can go into them 
like we've got this real like openness and transparency across like everything at Monzo. Um, so I find that like one of the first things I did was just go to like all the channels, um, in, like play around with your settings so it doesn't become overwhelming, so that you only get them pop up in your sidebar. But anyway, so that's one thing that you can do. Um, the other thing that we did with our designers it was we have like representatives for each one of the different teams. So even though there's like a, a lending rep, a partnerships rep. Like we come back and sit together, and then we will work together on like new ideas if we're coming up with something brand new. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any last questions? Okay, I think that's a wrap. Um, thank you all for joining this morning. Um, and thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, uh, thank you Diara and Chris, as well, for organizing. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, it's been a really interesting conversation and I hope you all can leave with some, again, thoughts, insights, uh, practical advice and resources as well. So thank you very much. And Chris. <laughs>